Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of UI Path Forward 2024 here in Las Vegas. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, alongside my co-host and analyst, Dave Vellante. We've got two guests for this segment. I'd like to introduce Tammy Becker. She is the SAP Global Rise Global Ecosystem Head. Thank you so much, Tammy. And Karthi Ramakrishnan. He is the Director of Planning Systems and RPA at Tapestry. Thank you both so much for coming on theCUBE. First timers, so this is, this is exciting. Yes, it is. I'd love to have you both start by just telling us, telling our viewers a little bit about your companies and what you do. Karthik, let's start with you. What is, what is Tapestry? Sure, Tapestry is the global house of brands that owns Coach, Kate Spade, and Stuart Weitzman. Each brand is unique, but Tapestry is a magical thread that weaves all the three brands together, hence the name. And at Tapestry, I'm a director of applications for planning systems and RPA. In addition to that, I also manage Salesforce Service Cloud, and uh, our corporate .NET and Java application stack, in addition to a vested interest with generative AI initiatives. Excellent, and Tammy, you're a 30-year veteran of SAP. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Pretty exciting. Tell us a little bit about what you do as a global ecosystem head. Yep, so I work very closely with our customers and our partners on cloud ERP and helping them realize that journey because many of our customers are still on-premise customers. We'd like to see them move to the cloud. And we want to help them get through that journey and we build you know, a framework with each customer to help guide them there. And, and where are you guys on that journey? Um, I'm presuming like many companies, you're hybrid, right? Yeah. So our SAP, if you think, where we were one of the pioneers to go to SAP S4 HANA as early as 2019. I think we were probably the second or third in, in the entire globe. And right now our SAP is on Google Cloud, but it's still, it's not on SAP Rise or BTP yet. But I do not know the strategy, but as of now I think we are very well entrenched in what we have built so far. And my other question is, my daughter's really into high-end fashion, and <laughs> wants to know what she has to do to get like a little inside baseball on <laughs> your brands. Uh, sure, <laughs> sure, anytime, anytime. We, we can speak <laughs> offline, I Okay, I'll show you her Instagram, it's quite impressive. <laughs> can you explain the Rise program, if you will, to explain Absolutely. to the audience what that is? Absolutely, so most of our customers that are sitting back on the earlier releases of ECC, early releases of S4, we are, Rise is really a journey for them. And we have, we want them to help, we want to help them realize that journey. We want to help them get to cloud ERP so that they can get to a persistent state of innovation, we call it. And we are recognizing now that most of our customers that haven't moved yet, are unsure of the journey, what it's going to look like, what starting points should they have. So I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of starting points. For example, it, they might say, my data is not in a good place right now. So as I'm moving to the cloud, my cloud ERP, my starting point is data cleansing. Because of course we know, as you're moving to AI, data is a key part of that. I mean, if you're, or I have a lot of custom code, so I've created a lot of technical debt how do I remediate that custom code into SAP's technology platform to move it forward? The beauty of them going to the cloud is really why the, the UiPath partnership is so important because they're able then to take advantage of building more efficient processes because they're able to take advantage of our upgrades moving forward. What's stopping them from doing that now is that technical debt. It's that data that they've been you know, growing for the last 30 years. So we will really want to help our customers move to the cloud so that they can become persistent innovators, work with UiPath on building out automations. And so we're, we're really excited. Thank you for that, Tammy. So, I mean, I feel like SAP's been on an automation journey for many, many decades. Of course, UiPath's a relatively new company. I mean, they're 10 years old now, but so they talk about Act 1 and Act 2. Uh, what about Tapestry? Where are you on your automation journey? How would you describe it? I'm interested in how this notion of you know, Act 1 and Act, Act 1 is RPA, Act 2 is sort of agentic to simplify it. Mm -hmm. How that resonates with you, or maybe you look at it similarly or, or differently. I'd love to hear the customer perspective. Uh, that's an excellent question. I think we started our automation journey as early as mid-2018, and thanks to our progressive leadership in both IT and the business, we were able to introduce UiPath relatively easier compared to a lot of other companies. And initially, we started our automation journey with finance. It's a natural progression because finance teams are the ones 
performing a lot of manual activities, especially if you take our controllers org. The controllers org, the team is constantly checking and balancing financial information to different systems, and that's their role. And most of them are manual activities, be it sales reconciliation between a point of sale systems and auto management system or lease information between the lease systems and SAP. And they spend a lot of hours working, you know, like odd hours during a week, or quarter close or month end close. It's kind of daunting and tedious, right? And we can build reconciliation systems for each of these specific use cases, but the cost outweighs the benefit. So that's where there's a natural lean towards using RPA to automate these manual activities to help them you know, focus on much more rewarding tasks rather than spending the time over a weekend uh, or, or a month and they could rather spend time with their family or pursue their you know, uh, hobbies. And um, that's where UFAP helps, right? But AI, now how AI can be added on to automation and help them further, it's like icing on the cake. But you need to have the automation framework very well set and robust and solid, and then you can throw AI there. And for example, optical character reading, OCR, we have a lot of invoices to process in our company. So we're exploring that and how could OCR scan the invoices and then pass it to RPA to perform further automation, right? And also, we have some generative AI apps that were built in Tapestry. For example, we built a simple quest and answer system. Now, for that, to, to get the data into this vector database or this app, we use RPA to web crawl our website or you know, strip data from Jira or Confluence or get documents from SharePoint and infuse into the database. So we are already pursuing this journey and I think there is more to explore, there's more to build and shine. It's interesting. I mean, the RPA description that you gave is very common, back office, um, and the ROI is a no-brainer. I mean, it was really clear. I feel like the, and tell me if you agree with this, the OCR example was a natural evolution um, from RPA. Again, ROI, pretty, pretty clear. And then the, the Gen AI piece, is that a rag that you've built? Uh, yes. Kind of a request retrieve? Yes. Which is, uh, uh, that's interesting that you're using RPA to populate the, the vector database. We built one, I don't know how we got the data in there. I imagine we <laughs> manually moved it in, but, but so that's another really good, good use case. So the premise that UI put, has, puts forth and presumably SAP as well is that by having the RPA, I call it plumbing, they don't like that term in marketing, but, but basically by having that core infrastructure, you can take advantage of it and, and, and make AI uh, more productive. Is that what you're finding? Um, in your particular situation with Tapestry and maybe Tammy with other customers? Absolutely, right? Uh, and th think about this, right? So we told our business users, internal business users, that hey, we have built this RAG question answer system, great, so give us all your documents. But they're also constantly updating documents. And each business unit, or some of you in our IT people, they use different systems for maintaining their documentation. Right? And we don't want to ask them to manually place their documents in a particular folder and then we pick and update them. So we alleviated the burden by telling, just let me know where you update the documents. We'll take the burden of picking those documents, whatever format it is, we'll convert it, we'll strip the data from wherever it is right. and introduce into the vector database, right? That is one aspect of it. Now, where I think agentic RPA would make a significant um, leap and, and help our customers is, you can orchestrate multiple things using agentic RPA. So one uh, particular application that we're building using generative AI is we connected our reporting database right. to a model and the app would convert questions in natural language into SQL queries, fire against the database and get you the response. It's coming out successfully, uh, it, it's, it's great. But think about it, right? So our executives could ask the question like, what are the te top 10 best-selling products from last quarter or last one year or last week? And what is the inventory of this product in this warehouse? Um, and what do you think about, um, you know, out of stock? Like what products were out of stock? What cost lost sales? And, Right now, 
for somebody to get that answer, you have to go to IT, you have to build reports, and if the data is not, the data is available, it's all there in the data lake, but it's not available in the reporting format. So it goes, it takes time for somebody to get the data and make decisions. Now it's inherently and easily available. So I think that's where the big win is. Right now, I can talk about something a little crazy as well. Now, now you have insights on data. Now, agenting RPA could give you the power of performing updates to data, right? For example, you can say, well, there is less stock in this store for this particular SKU, but you can see the sales were high last week. So please allocate more of these products from the warehouse to the store. Right, so you have the insights and you can also take actions. Of course, it has to be implemented very carefully, but these are possibilities. Can, can, I, can I ask a follow-up on that? Yeah, yeah, go for it. So, if I understand it, the, the, the system, the robots, are, or the agents, are harmonizing the data, is that right? Yes, that is, that is right. I mean, harmonizing is one way of putting it, but they're more like giving you insights quickly they're talking to data and giving you insights quickly, and it also enables you to perform updates. That, that's a really interesting piece, so it's not just a one-way pull. Yes. Um, you're doing the update, the two-way connections. Well, I'll park the harmonization question for later. So, well, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by this as well, and I'm wondering where the human is in this loop, only because I'm thinking about, <laughs> I'm thinking about the, 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 the warehouse and the inventory, and it, that purse was hot because some celebrity was wearing it on TikTok, or that purse was hot, but it's the, it was great weather, and now we're going to be into winter, and so we're, we're changing styles. And so I'm just, because fashion is so, is so fast-changing, how, how and where does the human judgment enter the equation there? Well, it is still the human that is passing the command to the bot to perform the activity. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Right? So it, the, the bot or the AI models are not doing it automatically. Right? We are not giving that power to the bot. The, the bot or the LLM is still a slave to the human in this case. The human asks a question, gets insights, and whatever decision the human wants to take, he can say, I don't want to allocate this or you can say reduce the stock or increase the stock. So it's a human passing the command. It's just that we're making it faster, intuitive, and, and a lot more easier to use. Can, can I run through a scenario and see if, if, if SAP has a perspective on this, Tammy, as well? Let's say there's an unexpected uh, heat wave in the Northeast and, and, and it's an early summer um, and you've got you know, inventory that is being targeted for, you know, some other part of the country and you want to reroute it. I could see the agents developing a, a, maybe two or three plans uh, to the humans and saying, here's plan one, here's plan two, here's plan three. And the humans saying, plan three, not practical for whatever reason. It violates some edict or, you know, P&L manager doesn't like it, whatever it is. But plan one and two, there's components of that. We like, hey, agents, put that together and come up with a you know, the blended plan. I mean, it, maybe this is all futuristic, but I could see in the future that capability where the human's in the loop, but the agents are doing the planning because they have access to the tool sets to do that. And the customer gets way better served and the brand makes more money and SAP sort of helps no, but make it all happen. We're seeing that now. And we have can do that today. We can do that today. So with our integrated business planning, working with UiPath and the data underneath to automate, what's amazing to me is the billions of pieces of data that we can pull in from all over the world, all over the globe, pull them together and build processes like that. The, the nice thing is SAP does have SAP Build, which does the automation across our solutions. Of course, we know better than to think an end-to-end -end business process is only SAP solutions, which is why our partnership with UiPath is so critical, to be able to build the end-to-end -end and pull all the data in from all of these various places, whether it's weather, whether it's mm. someone walking through a store and picking up their, you know, how, where the things that they're looking at and figuring out how you should market to that person just based on what they're doing within the store. 
It's fascinating to me. And a little creepy. Uh, it's a little it's creepy. creepy. <laughs> I mean, yes and no. I mean, as a consumer, hey, you want to make a suggestion to me? I'm, I'm open for it as, as long as it's not creepy. Right, right. Then you, you also made a comment, and I think it's, it's interesting. So when I get marketed to, I want to know that if I open something, an email that has a beautiful purse that I want, I want to know that it's available for me. Yeah. Well, exactly. So yes. that's another part of that, you know, building out all of that automation and making sure whatever I'm going to market to my customer to make it a very personalized experience for them that I can make sure that that is available in their marketplace in a timely manner. So, and that's all can be done through this automation. It's fascinating. I never thought I'd say that 30 years ago. I mean, this this. But what we're hearing now about this automation in luxury retail, it does sound so mind-blowingly innovative. What are some other trends that you're seeing that you're expecting in either luxury retail, but also in other maybe more general retail that you think could, could really could really change the way we live our lives and the way we shop? I think for, for us, it's going to be, it's a huge mindset change from an SAP customer perspective because our customers are used to, you know, working in on-premise environments, IT is working on upgrades, security, you know, all these aspects of keeping the lights on in their system. What we're seeing from a shift perspective now is IT is moving to a more innovated state. They're focusing on these applications. So I think it's going to be endless what we see moving forward. I'm really excited about what, what we can do with robots. So I do think automation is going to become huge across every industry. It's not just fashion for sure. I described a planning scenario that I thought was the future. Tammy basically said, no, we can do that today. It's happening now. So I'm, trying to interest, I'm interested in sort of what changes in the future. Will, and maybe you can do this today already. Uh, uh, will there be sort of a top-down, I'm, I'm imagining top-down metrics and goals. So, uh, grow revenue, uh, gain market share, but keep margins at whatever, 30% plus, something like that, that the agents, can understand and, and execute bottom up because you got two-way connections um, to have outcomes that maybe involve new processes. But is that something that is available today? Is that more in the future? Being able to be guided by those top-down metrics with very little human involvement, is, is that, do you see that in the future? Definitely in the future, but I would say we have to be very careful. We should not give too much power to these models. Uh, because they are as judgmental as us, right? Because the data that was used to build these models influences how these models behave, right? Um, so I would still love to have a human in the loop, get as many insights as possible, help you make faster decisions, but let the human make the final decision, right? Because you also have to consider empathy into place, compassion into place, and, and you know environmental factors into place the model might not consider those things, right? Um, so it could, could be, the, we don't want a Terminator or a Matrix movie scenario happening where, where the bots overtake and you know, try to do something that is detrimental to ourselves, right? They're supposed to help us. They're not supposed to, in my opinion, they're not supposed to override us or try to be smarter than us. Though they can be faster than us, not necessarily smarter, in my opinion, right? And yeah. one thing I would say, with respect to the luxury industry and how we are approaching it is, we already have a solid digital platform. Um, it's one platform for our end customers to shop. So we have the website and we have the backend order management system. Then we have a digital marketing tools in place and we also have customer care. Now it's one platform for all the three brands that we have built and we can roll it out. Now, how do we emboss and embellish it further, like icing on the cake? So when our customer logs into the website and wants to purchase a product, all they need to do is ask a question like, hey, what are the product that I think I should be buying? I'm going for this party, what do you think would be a trendy attire? And the shopping assistant should be able to provide this information. We are not there yet, but these are ideas and we are slowly building them, right? And if they want to say, well, you know what, I would probably, like a similar product that I've seen on the internet, they can do a like search, image search, and find something similar. Or, you know, there are so many things that you can do in the luxury industry, and especially with 
generation advancement that we are having and the Gen Zs shop everything through their mobile phone for the most part. Now they want it to be interactive, like talk or type. They don't even go to a laptop and type a website anymore. So how do we attract those young new customers and keep our brand growing? If revenue definitely is true, but also give a white glove treatment to our end customers so they are, you know, they feel nice and happy about shopping on our websites. So those are some things that we are pursuing and thinking about. And just in, it, just in terms of the process, you know, it's kind of the back end process. I mean, I'm envisioning, and it might take 10 years, it might be the middle of the next decade, where you've got data, you have proprietary data, you have, you're, that's your play, customers and their proprietary data so they can get competitive advantage not trained on the internet. And you, humans reason with these plans that we talk about, they, you don't trust the agents today and that's smart, but humans can reason and agents can watch and learn and from those reasoning traces. And again, it might take 10 years, but I can see a flywheel where you've got data, you've got proprietary data, you've got reasoning traces from humans that agents learn. And then over time, maybe with humans still in the loop, you give agents more control. Um, and then, then you can trust them you know, more. But that's, uh, that's obviously not here today. I think Craig LeClaire has said later this decade, we'll start to see that. Uh, but that's a totally different future of applications. You mentioned basically you're an application head. Yep. I mean, appli the application stack seems to be reforming before our eyes. You know, the traditional three-tiered application right. has some new components in it. Data harmonization, which I said I would park, the agentic <laughs> control framework, the top-down ability, the, the back-end connections, those two-way connections that you talked about. That's a different application model than what we know today, isn't it? Yes, completely. It, it's, it's very different. But the way I think about it is, it is it has to be cohesive, right? You're just bringing in a new AI stack and adding intelligence to the entire layer. And at the end of the day, AI in itself, it's not very useful unless otherwise you have a solid foundation and framework and you have all the data points connected to AI and you, you enable it to perform that work. Now, how to come up with the right ideas, I think that's the key. Now, you can build a generative AI app and make it fancy, but what is, what is the true benefit, right? So we have to look into those use cases and it's industry specific, right? Every industry can have unique uh, cases and even within every industry, each company can have a different goal or different agenda. So coming up with these use cases and ideas is very important. And so you have to be a dreamer. In my opinion, though I'm a technologist, um, the way I started learning AI was I, I said, said to all my friends, I do not go through any course. N nothing on YouTube, nothing on Coursera, nothing on Udemy. The only thing I did was I tinkered with multiple generative AI models for a, like three or four months every day for three to four hours. I just tried different scenarios with almost 100 plus models. Then it gave me a hang of how these models behave. What are they good at? What are they bad at? Where do they slip? And that, that helped me understand what use case I can use and what is the right model I should pick. I think that's an exercise that everybody, I would recommend that everybody go through the exercise and you would automatically be showered with ideas. I love this advice. So you did this with off-the-shelf LLMs or was it, were you, were you digging in and doing programming with these, developer with these LLMs or both? That's a great question. So I use enterprise-grade LLMs. So we had access to enterprise-grade LLMs in our company and I, I just played with them all from different service providers and, and that's where that's where I learned, and thanks to my leadership, they, they give me free access. It's go try, <laughs> right? And of course, I burned a lot of cash. I'm just kidding. But but yeah, I mean, I got uh, good support and, and access to these models. So you know, the, the first three or four months was all this foundational learning. And when I came out of it, I had like a laundry list of ideas. And we started exploring them one by one based on priority and ROI. Can I ask you a question on that? So you've obviously seen the way these models leapfrog each other. Uh, there's, a, there's two camps. One that says, oh, these models are going to just be, all become commoditized. There's another camp that says, no, the innovation will continue. Uh, do you have a, an opinion on that? I do. I would say 
that there would always be competition and we need to have that competition because we want multiple service providers with multiple models and I don't want to see a lot of consolidation in this space because it gives me as end customer an advantage. Like I can pick this particular model for this use case and I can pick some other model for a different use case, right? So I would, I would want this um, bouquet of models to be available so I can pick and choose and also cost, right? And, and also on, you also have to be careful on how these models were trained. There are some models in mind they might work great, but what kind of data was used to train those models, right? Now, if, if the data is not considered, say, for, you know, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You right? want transparency on yeah, how you train. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's the right word. I was yeah. searching for it. So I think that's key to help us make a decision. Well, Karthik and Tammy both, thank you so much for coming on the on the Cube. A really Great fun conversation. conversation. And I can't wait to shop in the future. <laughs> That's yeah. fun. You're very welcome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of the Cube's live coverage of UiPath Forward. You're watching the Cube, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.